Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grow Big TV. Thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> we have Dr. Paula Ruffin. And I'm sorry, I have a cold, so you may hear me sniffling a little bit. I've been sick the past couple of days. Go figure. I feel like I am always sick. It's getting a little old. <laughs> I can tell you that. So tonight we have a special guest who is Dr. Paula Ruffin. We're going to be talking about the health benefits of chestnuts. And um, I'm kind of really interested in this because I'm more, I'm really it really interested in gut health in general because I have a lot of stomach issues. So that's really cool. So I want to thank you guys for coming in and hanging out with us tonight. And the first 50 people in here tonight is going to win one of these suckers. So share us out, share us out as many, as many as you can. This is our grow big TV magnet. So you'll get one if we get 50 people in here. And um, I'll do like a number countdown or something as soon as we hit 50. So share us out. Um, okay. Um, what else? <clears throat> I haven't been I haven't been doing a whole lot of gardening, but I have bought a lot of seeds. So I have um, a lot of that coming in the mail as of recently. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through the list and just, you know, welcome everybody to the show. So thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. The Wick, Wick, Wickshire Project. Thank you for coming in, Billy. Urban Harvest. Uh, Gil at Camp Hatton Family Compound. Thank you so much. Kaylin Strain. Uh, Seth Fairbrook Studio. Thank you so much. Bill is here. Thank you so much. Of course, Dr. Pro Paula Ruffin is in the house. Thank you so much. Uh, Kaylin Strain. Always a pleasure. Susan, uh, Susan Gullet, Gullet, <laughs> thank you for coming in. Um, Laura Larson, thank you so much. Jaden, it's a pleasure. Denise, uh, Uncle Al, Mike's Chaotic Gardening. Who else? Purple Tea Bear, of course, my number one fan, Ginger Ninja, thank you so much. Happy Mac, built on a uh, rock. I almost said built on a Mac. That wouldn't have made sense. Wildlife, thank you for coming in. Cheryl Watson. And who else? Kimberly Gil, Gil, Gil. Thank you guys uh, for coming and I appreciate you. So let's go ahead and go ahead and bring my guests up. And then we will have a wonderful conversation about gut health and um, chestnuts because it's very important for your stomach and health benefits. <sighs> Sorry, guys. I can barely breathe. <laughs> I'm trying here. I'm trying. Okay. Here she is. Hey! <laughs> How's everybody doing? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> please, y'all, make sure you share us out. And if you haven't already, please go over to Dr. Paula uh, Ruffin's uh, YouTube page and subscribe. Last time I heard, she is looking for a thousand subscribers. So please go over there and help her out. Oh my I gosh! Really man. Appreciate I'm sorry. That. And uh, you know what? All this being sick and everything could be li linked to my gut health. <laughs> um, I am not doing very well. Um, I seriously, um, okay. So I was sick before, a little bit before my son's birthday. Well, my son's birthday was November 16th. So as of right now, I feel like I have seriously been sick for an entire month, a little over a month, and I'm getting real sick of it. I... I'm also extremely stubborn and refuse to get put on antibiotics because why? <laughs> They're, it's not good for your gut health. <laughs> so I refuse. So I keep probably am repeating the same patterns over and over again because I refuse to go to the doctor. I'm not dying or anything, but it's like I refuse to get an antibiotic. So there's that. All right. Well, that's a great point too, if I can just jump in for a sec, because, um, you know, people get a sniffle and they run off to antibiotics, which wipes out your gut health. And then, and then people are like, oh my God, it was a miracle. It helped. But then I got sick three days after I went off the antibiotic. Yeah. Cause you just wiped out everything that you needed to protect yourself. So the, the antibiotic while you're on it, it kills anything else coming in, but then it <clears throat> cleans you out so that you have no protection anymore. So I am actually in favor of you suffering uh, because we're going to fix you. We're going to get it all good. 
Ooh, I like I like that. I want to get fixed. I'm tired of this crap, man. I bet. It seems like every year, as soon as my uh, my son goes to school, I fear it. I fear <laughs> from going to school because I know he's going to do. Last year, it was the plague of the pink eye. Like I had pink eye for three months. My son touches stuff and he doesn't know any better. He doesn't wipe off his hands or whatever. And then he loves to touch mom. And what happens? Pink eye. <laughs> thank God that has not happened this year yet. Thank God. Um, well, you know, in the same respect too, that, you know, we say we get sick and kids are Petri dishes and they want to touch us and we touch our face and they touch our face this is how we build immunity is by touching each other and getting close. But when there's a weakness there, it does work that, that same way. So if we can flip that around for you and say, okay, what do we have to do so that uh, when you're sharing those germs back and forth and all that bacteria, it's actually building both of you. Right. Cause I think you told me before that he's actually, he gets sick a lot too, doesn't he? Um, yeah, he has been, uh, ever since he, he's hit school, but up until then he wasn't sick at all. Like yeah. rarely. I mean, and now that he's in school, he's sick, which is fine. I think if, if it is building up his immune system, but ear infections and stuff are just not, it's not nice. And yeah. he's already had several antibiotics already. And it irritates me because mm -hmm. they put him on amoxicillin which is the number one go-to for ear infections. Yeah. And it never works. And then we have to go to something stronger. So he gets like a double dose of antibiotics. It's just frustrating. It keeps wiping them out. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they'll, they'll put them on um, steroids if they haven't already, you know? So, <clears throat> and it's a, when you think about those treatments, those are like blanket treatments. They're a one size fits all treatment and we're not all one size. So, um, you know, what, what is it that we need to do to, to build, build you guys up? Yeah. Um, I have been on, on immune. I have a, I have a compromised immune system anyway, but I, um, used to take a bunch of stuff, echinacea. I used to take echinacea and golden seal quite often, but you can't take it all the time because then your body gets used to it and then you, it's no good to you anymore. Yeah. So I think I need to start doing that again. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> I'm tired of this. Well, and the, the, um, the number one nutrient to take, if I always said, if you put a gun to my head and said, no, I, I only want to take one, which one am I going to take? And I'm going to tell you it's vitamin D because we just don't get enough of it. And even when we do, you know, I'm outside all summer long and I don't use sunscreen and my vitamin D is still only about 55. It really should be up over 75. Yeah, so I guarantee you it's my vitamin D. I, yeah. Yeah. You start taking, you know, whatever your number is, start taking vitamin D today, tomorrow, and you'll start to notice that that'll, and for your son too, really important. A lot of docs won't even test kids because they don't find it valid for young children. Yeah. Uh, I've tested kids in my office and their, their vitamin D was a six and you cannot survive without vitamin D. So if it needs to be up over 75, can you only imagine how sick those people are if they're a six? You know? Yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, yeah. and it's more than just being sick. If you're low on vitamin D, it just, you feel like crap in general, headaches, mm -hmm. um, fatigue. Lethargic, yeah. Yep. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uncle Al says I need to eat more kimchi. Well, I well, for, I don't fermented. disagree with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, some fermentation. But yeah, and all of this, the the gunk up here, that's all gut. So yeah. You and you had said it's probably because my gut isn't good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, okay. I don't I'll probably end up getting gross, but I don't really care because I we're all adults here. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Well, and somebody else is probably experiencing whatever it is you're going to say. So how about but, that? Okay. So I went to the doctor and <laughs> I went to the doctor, a gut specialist, and they never tested me. They just said, bam, you have IBS. And then they wanted me to do um, a poop test at home and send it away. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I didn't do it. Oh, um, you should. 
I don't want to. Why not? <laughs> don't you should me. totally do that. It's a great way. I actually do urine. I test gut by urine. Oh, well, that's better. Yeah, so <laughs> it is a little easier. I know, I know. I don't really think I would go do a mail carrier. What's that? Imagine, can you imagine being a mail carrier? You know what it is because it's in a cup thingy that's specific. Like you can't yeah. mistake that. Like you <laughs> well, know no, you is. wrap it up. You get a yeah. I, I have a a five year old boy that I'm working with, and he came in tonight. We're gonna we're gonna send off his pee to check his gut, mm -hmm. and um, he was like, I don't want people looking at my pee. <laughs> Or like, it's okay, buddy. It's okay. And then, uh, and then his mom goes, you can laugh when the mail carrier comes and picks it up. He's like, Oh, okay. That sounds. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's how we entertain kids is tell them that other people are going to be holding on to their pee. <laughs> yeah. Well, right after, okay. So right after I had my son, my gut health had, had been horrific. I had um, um, a lot of emergency things happen to me after I had my son and one of them is I had to have bagged antibiotics, which was like a really high potent antibiotic. Were and you ever strep, were you strep positive? Strep B positive? No. When you had, I had to have the doctor, the doctor messed up, and I had to have an emergency DNC after I had a C section. Wow. wow. So I had to go to the doctor, and he had to fix me. Those two and things don't. I have. I had what was called. Um, I had an infection in my uterus, basically. Endometriitis okay. is what they call okay. it. And um, so I had to have a bag of antibiotics. And when I did that, ever since then, I had noticed, and even after my C-section, I noticed that my stomach was so screwed up. And I, one time I ate corn at a family event and like had to go to the emergency room. Wow which was not like me before. Like I could always eat that kind of stuff. It wasn't a problem. Yeah. And I, and since then, then I had um, been diagnosed with IBS, but I don't really think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm just like, I don't feel like it's, that's what it is. I'm not going to get tested for it because I don't feel like that's what it is. I think I just had a high potent antibiotic that screwed up my stomach and I get massive amounts of heartburn all the time. It, it's a little bit better now, but I used to like not want to leave the house. And I'm going to share a little detail. Um, I used to have to carry a bag and toilet paper around with me everywhere I go. Just Ugh, in case. That's um, awful. Yeah. Oh my horrible. God, it's horrible. Yes. And yeah. so. Um, you can't be on, on antibiotics like that. That's the thing. It's, yeah. you know. How did, how did you get that infection to begin with? What, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> the doctor left the, uh, some of the placenta inside of me during the DNC or during the, uh, C -C -C. okay. Okay. So yeah. yeah. And that's awesome. It was horrible. I, yeah. I, from, uh, November until January 1st, I almost died. <laughs> wow. Holy yeah, that's moly. how long I had afterbirth issues. So were you, um, prior to getting pregnant, were you fine? Were you healthy or had you had some issues? No, I was fine. You were totally fine. Yeah. So there case in point, you know, mm -hmm. let's just go ahead and give you all these antibiotics and, um, well, and, and the reason I asked if you were strep B positive is because I was, and if you're strep B positive, they give you antibiotics during the birth process. So that's oh, your okay. child's first introduction yeah. to, you know, they're, they're born with a sterile gut and maybe they yeah. get, you know, if, if you've been doing your job, maybe they come out with a handful of good bacteria in there, but then the doctors are like, no, you're strep B positive. Let's give you antibiotics during the birth process. <clears throat> that wipes baby out, yeah. that wipes mom out. And, you know, cause again, it's intravenous and it. it's like, it's just going, you know, coursing through your blood. It's taken everything with it. It's terrible. No, I'm not, you guys, antibiotics are really cool. They do everything they're supposed to do. They have healed people beyond great measures. However, it's not something to be taken lightly. Like if you have a sniffle, you don't go and get, um, an antibiotic because exactly. it's, it's for emergency purposes. 
You should be mm -hmm. on your deathbed or have a really bad infection or something like that in order to get antibiotics. It's not to be taken lightly because it can really screw you up. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too. Um, and, and yes, you're right. We're, we have to preface this by saying, uh, you know, a, this is not medical advice and B, um, if there's an emergency, that's what they're for. Right. And when I, when I look at the, the, um, there's a, 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 a movie called, um, the, the, the business of, uh, what is it? The business of, of birth, the business, of, I'll, I'll figure it out. Great, great documentary. You guys all need to watch that because it, um, and, and I experienced a lot of that. I was 37 when I got pregnant. So I had, I was considered a geriatric pregnancy and it, I said, whoa, this is the complete bastardization of one of the most beautiful things that could ever happen because they wanted to give me every intervention under the sun. And I'm like, I'm a healthy individual, like I'm 37 years old. I'm not dead. I'm not 60 and I'm going to have a healthy baby. Um, and at one point they said, well, you should do a, um, and, uh, you know, where, where they stick the needle in your belly. Um, and they said, because they found something on the ultrasound in her brain and her kidney, and that was a sign of down syndrome. And if I uh, did the uh, amniocentesis is what it is. And if I did the amniocentesis, then we'd know for sure. And then that way I could abort the pregnancy. And I'm like, I get was a horrible, horrible experience. And it was one experience like that. Did you end after... up getting that done? Because that's that no. test in general is extremely dangerous. I know. No, I was, I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking my chances. And I never had another ultrasound. I never had. And then, then, but then they're required to test you for strep B, which is basically a yeast infection. And okay. Okay. Boys cover your ears. But when you're pregnant, it's nearly impossible to not feel like you don't have a yeast infection. Like, yeah, because you got a lot of things going on down there. Yeah. Yeah. General. Yeah. So, and there's so probably that, weird stuff that women have never even felt before either. Right. They're always questioning, right. what is this? Yeah. Yeah. And 40% of women test positive for strep B. And when they do, they're required to give you an IV antibiotic during birth. And I don't even, I don't even know where that came from, but it's been going on for many years. And I started thinking, oh, follow the money, you know, just follow the freaking money on okay. that. I don't really understand either. Like what would happen if somebody gave birth and they didn't have that strep B, they didn't have an antibiotic. What would that do? It, it's, it, they're, they're concerned if you're, if you are positive and you give birth vaginally, they're like, oh, but the baby could get strep then. It's like, well, the baby's supposed to come through the birth canal and get all of the mother's bacteria because that's how we start life. The other thing it does is it squeezes all the fluid out of the baby so that they now, now they don't have all of that excess fluid and oh, they're not having okay. to, their bodies don't have to struggle to get rid of it. So, you know, that's really where, um, and we, we see, especially if it's a C-section, those kids are more sick because they didn't experience those two things right from the get go. They didn't get your vaginal bacteria on there. That's, that's really important bacteria for us to start life with. So, um, so we do see higher incidences, incidences of kids with, um, with illnesses and, uh, learning issues and things like that in C-section babies. I didn't know that. That's really good. Yeah. To know. yeah. Uh, let's see. I was trying to tell Kenny to get over here. <clears throat> hello, um, everybody, and hello everybody over in Facebook land. I see you making, uh, comments and um jump up yeah if you can jump on over to our youtube yeah um that's where the party's at i shared there's it over party. to my one of my groups over there so cool. um and thank you to jay dixon the the business of being born and um that link is there so i would highly recommend you you check that out because it's not a yeah it's not normal what they do with um pregnancy they've medicalized pregnancy and if you, you know, I was told, cause I said, well, I don't want to get the, the strep B test because I didn't want the antibiotics. And they said, well, um, your child is a ward of the state. And so when it's born, if you decline, if you decline the test, 
your child's award of the state, they will automatically take your baby from you and do whatever they need to do to it to make sure wow. that it's healthy. And then I said, well, what if I test positive and I deny the antibiotics? And they said, same thing. They'll take your baby from, they're threatening me at 37 years old. They're going to take my baby because I am not lining up for this ridiculous medical intervention. Yeah. So this is why you you have got to advocate for yourself. You have to know this information so that um, you don't line up and and just you, you know yeah. There's a time and place for those things. Um, pregnancy is not one of them. Like let pregnancy be beautiful, um, in my opinion. And not that we're steering away from the topic, guys, but this has a lot to do with gut mm-hmm. health. <laughs> yeah, because this is where it starts. Mm-hmm. You know, right from the the right from the get go. This is your your baby's health, your health. Um, it goes right from the beginning. So, um, all well, and that baby's about- born with that sterile gut, and then if it comes through the the vaginal canal, now it's bathed in bacteria, and it gets in the baby's mouth, and then it that's the first colonization of the gut. So when you don't have that you come out and now you have to rely on outside forces. And a lot of uh, women aren't aware of if you have to have a C-section and, and, you know, first of all, there's far too many C-sections that's already been proven that that's a, you know, um, a lot of them become scheduled or a lot of women. Because I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I, I had gestational diabetes. Right. So, so they'll, so they'll they just say that. I right. didn't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And you probably did, but it's just a different route and a different, you know, doctor or midwife or, um, and yeah, that is a, it's a higher risk for sure. Um, that would be a case. I would say absolutely. You need to be in a hospital to make sure that that's managed. Um, so yeah. So, so then, the, then it's like, okay, well then you need to be taught when you're in the hospital, okay, well, how did I get this? Now that I know I have it, what do I do with it? How do I protect my baby since it didn't get all the bacteria from, you know, going through the birth canal? Uh, So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes on that those questions aren't answered. And then you're just sent home with your baby and it's colicky and it has ear infections and it, and it, um, uh, you know, reflux and, uh, doesn't sleep. Or if you're nursing, it doesn't, won't latch. I mean, so much of, of what we are supposed to be doing comes right from that first, um, uh, experience. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. Sorry, I see. You, I, went off on that. I know you're on the other side. I see yeah. you. I see you. There. Penny, come to this side. What are you doing over there? <laughs> yeah. Um, we oh, can, we, yeah, we can see you. Yeah. I would like to thank you guys for coming in tonight. Um, if we get to 50 people, I'm going to give away our grow big TV magnet. So, um, share us out. Let us let people know about we're live right now. That is the big one because YouTube likes to, uh, tell people that we're not live or doesn't oh, really, you know, they just thing? don't notify people at all. <laughs> oh, oh, so, that's lovely. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. just let people know and share us out. I didn't um, know yeah. that. Uncle Al, you're 100% right on the kimchi. Um, It's a little zesty. Um, But yeah, you're 100% right. And um, kimchi and um, sauerkraut and pickles. um, All this, anything that can be um, fermented is exceptionally good for your gut health. So um, if you eat a lot of sauerkraut, whatever. That's really good for you. Cabbage in general is really good for you. It's an anti-inflammatory and um, it's really good for your health. So if you can incorporate that in your diet, you know, go for it. (laughs) Well, and um, cabbage, any of the brassicas. And um, so you guys are doing cauliflower this week, right? And, um, cauliflower, I talked about when you did, uh, broccoli a couple weeks ago, that cauliflower has the same, uh, compound in it, sulforaphane. And, uh, so sulforaphane is actually highly anti-inflammatory. 
It's an excellent antioxidant. It helps to balance the gut. And then with all the fiber in those, um, those vegetables, that alone, those, those act as prebiotics to help feed the good gut bacteria. So, you know, it's, it's great all the way around. Whew, sorry guys. I just had a coughing spell. Give me a minute. You, you cough. I'll go. Okay. I'll keep going. So, uh, so yeah. And, and also, you know, like stay tuned here because these guys are doing, I love what they're doing every week, bringing up, you know, talking about a different vegetable, how to grow it, all the different varieties. And then I'm coming in and I'm giving the health benefits behind it. So, so yeah, yeah so <clears throat> this week is, is cauliflower. So a little bit of insight, it's going to sound a little similar to broccoli, but it's such an important compound for your health that it is worth repeating for sure. Yeah. And, um, we're going to, yeah, so Thursday, we're going to be doing cauliflower talking about it. And, um, <clears throat> we look forward to seeing you guys then it's going to be a great, great show. <clears throat> Sorry, excited. Guys, man. This is horrible. <laughs> All right. So I know we were going to talk about chestnuts and the benefits of chestnuts, but, <clears throat> just in general, there's a lot of things throughout this, this time that I've learned about gut health that I didn't really know before. And not that I didn't want to know, I just was uneducated about it. Cause I didn't, you know, but it, it wasn't till I started having all these gut problems that I started doing more and more research about it. So <laughs> one of the, one thing that I have learned throughout this time is to drink bitters, which is supposed to be really, really good for you. And by the way, <laughs> Baker Creek right now has bitter seeds. So if you want to grow that and make your own tea, you go right ahead and do so. <laughs> I didn't know that was a grow thing. I thought yeah. that was like a fermenting, fermenting thing. It's a tea and it's really good for your gut health and diabetes. And all that. I mean, I've got four bottles of bitters up there. So I, I put them in like I'm drinking, um, sparkling, uh, spring water right now. And I, every, I don't, I didn't put anything in it tonight, but sometimes I'll put, um, a really high quality vinegar in there or I'll throw bitters in there. Nice. Helps tremendously. Hey, proper one one Thanks guys for coming in. I appreciate you. Yes. Eat more chestnuts, <laughs> Uncle Al. We're, we're going to get to that, but you know, I think it was good that we started off on that foot because it just started off organically and, I, I do think it's really important for people to understand that this stuff goes back really far and you get to a point where you're an adult and like Corky, she, um, you know, she had a, a medical issue that required something that caused severe damage. And then, and if the, if the medical community could bridge the gap and say, okay, now you need to go see a functional nutritionist or if they had functional nutritionists on staff that they could provide you, okay, listen, you know, you, you're close to death. And if we don't do this, then you're going to die. However, we're going to bring you back, but this, these are things you have to do to make sure that it doesn't have a long-term impact. So, um, so that's really where, where I wish the medical community would, would really get on board is helping people with, you know, I saw somebody said they've had trouble ever since they had the gallbladder taken out. Okay, when you get the gallbladder taken out, nobody says to you, okay, now let's help you with why the gallbladder went bad to begin with. Because that was years of, you know, it could have been poor diet, it could have been medications, it could have been those medical interventions. So, so I think it's good that we started off because again, when you look at your kids and they're like, how can my kid be sick? Why is my kid always sick? You know, this five-year-old that came in today, constantly sick. Um, so we're going to get him better. But between chiropractic care and then nutritional interventions, it's going to be, I told her, I said six months to a year to get this back on deck. So, um, and, and so, you know, we don't want to ignore those things when we're young and we don't want to ignore them, um, when they come about as adults. So, and the frustrating part is that a lot of people, it takes the average, it's 10 years before someone gets to a place where they find an answer for what they have going on when it comes to their gut health. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably an older statistic because that information is much more commonly available now. But, um, but that's, as you said, Corky, it's like, how long did it take you in the search for information? 
Right. And I didn't have those issues right after I had my gallbladder <laughs> taken out. Um, I didn't have, I mean, though, now that I think about it, that was where my love for green beans came in. And I questioned myself as to what happened because I used to hate green beans and um, I started craving them and stuff. And I'm like, what in the hell is wrong with me? Because <laughs> I hated them before. And I did some research and uh, found out that uh, you're, when you remove your gallbladder, you're missing vitamin K. And green beans are filled with vitamin K. So if you are craving something, unusual that you've never craved before, like greens or, or beans or something out of the ordinary, um, look it up and figure out why am I craving this? Because it's something your body is lacking. Yeah. That was, um, when I was pregnant, I was craving, I had to have a liverwurst sandwich loaded with mayo and okay. I had to have one every day. I was like, I don't know what it was. I had to eat liver. And, um, I was getting acupuncture at the time and my acupuncturist, he, he goes, let me go check that. And he comes back and he goes, Oh, the baby's liver is developing. So that was my, I was like eating tons of liver. And that was my body intuitively saying to me, um, you, yeah, you need liver to support this baby's growth of the liver. Right. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing. Right. It does. The, the same does not go for donuts though. Okay. Craving donuts does not. <laughs> <laughs> that's something. That's just something that you're just. I'm, I'm craving like the baby wants it. Wants something sweet or right. Something. Right. And but, no, uh, Kenny, I'm not putting Miracle Whip on it. <laughs> <laughs> I like Miracle Whip. <laughs> oh my god! So we ask that question at the end of every show: Miracle Whip or mayonnaise? Because Kenny and I have an argument over that. So <laughs> he's the Miracle Whip fanatic and I'm the mayo fanatic. No, so. I'm I'm not a fanatic in either or. Like I can eat either or. It's not a problem. But I did grow up on Miracle Whip. Like my mom used That's it. Right, so yeah. Salads and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Uncle cool. Al says chestnut donuts. And that sounds amazing. I have chestnut flour. I have roasted chestnut flour. I've got sweet chestnut flour that came from Italy. Um I was down at, um, when Bill comes on, I was down, they, they also do pawpaws. So I was down watching them process pawpaws and they had a big thing of chestnut flour that came in from, it was from the Italian chestnuts and it was, it was like sugar. I mean, it was so sweet. And, um, I made a, um, I made a bread and I, you know, kind of like a banana bread, but I put, I put papa puree in it and I put chopped chestnuts in it. Ooh. It was so good. It was absolutely, and of course, super healthy. So, um, yeah, I got to make some chestnut. Pan I wonder if you can make crepes out of the chestnut flour. I'm would sure. They, you yeah. I'm thinking they would have to, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, funny. Do you make crepes a lot? No. I, when I was growing up, we made them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, I've been craving them. I have a, I have a friend of mine that does, she's got a channel on Instagram called um, return to the table. And her whole thing is to help people cook family meals and have family dinners again. And she says, you know, she's like, why are, uh, why are, why aren't French people fat and they drink wine and they eat bread and they eat cheese and they eat meat is because it, it's such a different quality of food over there. So she sources all this stuff. And I took a class and made, I did a buckwheat um, pancake, a buckwheat um, crepes. I think wow. it was probably about a year ago, maybe a couple of years ago and made just a huge stack of them. And then you throw them in the freezer and they freeze beautifully. And oh my God, I'm going to have to make crepes tomorrow. <laughs> you guys, it's, I can't, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm going to use that chestnut flour. That's this would nice. be amazing. That sounds good. It's been a long time since I made that anything like that. So do you, um, how do you, how do you make yours? Just flour milk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you have a special pan. Um, you're supposed, well, yeah, I kind of do. Um, you're supposed to use like a, I don't know, a really flat pan, but it, yeah. I guess it doesn't matter. My mom would always use a nonstick skillet to make mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So you can make them very large if you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I've, I've done them on cast iron before, so. 
Yeah, I have a cast iron crepe pan. So, and yeah, to the just a quick side note, I had an aunt, a great aunt, and she baked bread. I don't ever remember not seeing her bake bread, but she would bake bake um the, you know, the the Syrian bread, the thicker loaves, and then she would bake the the really thin, 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 like it was paper thin, and she would toss it like pizza. And she'd pull that out of out of the oven and it was in her basement with a dirt floor, like it was crazy. Um, and we she'd hand each of us a you know this huge thing and we'd run upstairs and we'd either slather it with peanut butter or just butter and roll it up like a cigar. And oh my god, it was so good. So good. <laughs> Who doesn't love fresh bread? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so right. good. Oh, Jay pulled up cre- uh chestnut flour crepes. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Doing that tomorrow. <laughs> Wicker, Wickershire Project says Miracle Whip is an abomination. I'm sorry. It's, it's funny so because it's the, it's really like these two camps. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, I grew up with a really prominent German family and um, we never really called them crepes. We called them balachingas. Oh, and so okay. then, is that a French oh, word? It's it's not a French word. I think it's actually German for pancake. Oh, okay. And it's so funny. I have friends from all over the world. I had a friend from Hungary come in and visit me, and I told her I said, "Will we make you know? We'll make bala chingas." And she's like, "What is that?" And oh, she calls it. She calls it bala senta or something like that. Oh, so that's she, funny. It was very yeah. strange. <laughs> but anyway, there we always stuffed them with jelly we never put okay. anything else in them like yeah you know, some people put <clears throat> i don't know like pudding in them or something like that and we never did anything like that we'd always just have like strawberry jelly or sometimes would have orange or would get like different jellies and put them in the center i'm a i'm a butter and cinnamon sugar girl on everything oh my god cinnamon sugar. so yeah i mean that was, we always had a, had a container of cinnamon sugar on the table growing up, you know, <laughs> so good. So good. Yes. Marmalade. I couldn't think of the name. Mar- of it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. It's not really my go-to. It was something my grandma always liked. She was like, Oh, marmalade. It must be like, I don't know. I don't know. If I feel person. like that is a, that's a, that generation. Thing. Yeah, I think so. Marmalade I- was not good. I mean, <laughs> I it was so. just sugar and orange peels. Like, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, the FDA does allow chemicals and ingredients in our foods. So we have um uh in fact this little boy tonight, we're testing him for glyphosate roundup. Um, because the the roundup just doesn't go away. Uh and you know, you can like I don't spray my lawn, but it's it's everywhere, it is in our food supply. Um, you can't you know, avoid it. You cannot avoid it. So now it's a matter of how toxic are you in glyphosate? And, um, you know, this poor little boy is just sick and sick and sick. So we got to test to make sure he's okay. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece. If you're having health challenges and you can't get your arms around it, um, you might want to look at glyphosate poisoning. And that would be, um, you know, something where you find somebody who can chelate. So an IV chelation to pull that out of the blood is really going to be your best way to, to get rid of it. You can try, um, diatomaceous earth, um, charcoal, um, orally, you can try those kinds of things. Um, but I think probably, probably getting your, your, um, an IV chelator might be your best, the fastest way to get rid of it. Well, Mike, how old are you? If you like marmalade, I need to know your age. Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Um uh Tammy, there's yeah, there is a test. Yeah, so it's we're doing urine for the for Roundup. I don't know if there's a blood test, but we're doing a urine test for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I use a, um mosaic diagnostics is the lab that I use. He's 53. Oh, okay. You must be an old soul, Mike. Mike is not. not you didn't really have to tell us your age, but thank you. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you like marmalade. That's <laughs> on a uh, on an English muffin with lots of butter. Yeah, 
It's about it was the only way I could gag down the uh, the marmalade was yeah, lots of butter, lots of butter. <laughs> Happy Max said that you're 92 and you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> had soil oh um I, yeah i'm talking about testing your your health testing your body um i don't know how to test the soil for glyphosate but i would imagine you could probably send it to msu um you know you can send water and soil um to any extension university so i'm, I'm just guessing but that might be an option so and shame on them you know it's interesting because um, Bill and I were talking today about soil and the chestnuts and how um, people, so let's say you have a farm and it's a monocrop and then they <clears throat> sell it and then they build houses and then people move in and then they want to grow grass and they want to go grow trees and they want to grow vegetation and everything dies because that, that earth has been so adulterated with Roundup and all the other chemicals. So I was like, God, I never really thought about that. And so we were talking about like, you know, the pH of soil and how do you bring that, that back? And, um, on my Sunday night live, I had that holistic dentist on Dr. Joel Gould. And he said, sulfur helps to, um, liberate the nitrogen so that we get nitrogen. We had uh, nitric oxide is incredibly healthy for blood flow, gut health, all of that. And then the, the sulfur itself helps to, um, replete, re replenish the mucous membrane. And um, so he was saying that's the same thing in gardening. You put sulfur to bring the pH down to actually liberate the nitrogen. To, and I was like, yeah, like that's so cool, right? So, yeah. which again is so cool that we're having this conversation because when you talk about growing things, growing you or growing anything in the dirt, it's all very similar. Yeah. Um, it's really kind of scary how much stuff that people put in the soil and they don't think about it. Yeah. Like I have neighbors all around me that just saturate their soil and their lawns. I mean, I don't give a crap if I have the perfect lawn. I mean, I do have grass. I do not spray my grass. Same. Um, I think my yard looks pretty dang good for not spraying my grass. Um, but my neighbors are just, I mean, think about it though. Like, I mean, they, they at least have three acres three or four acres and all around me and um, my mom and I together, we have five. So, I mean, if you're spraying all that constantly with lawn, you know, lawn feed and everything else, I mean, it's just getting in the water. It's getting everywhere and everywhere around here has well water. So have you had your well water tested? I haven't yet. Now I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's also something that, um, I did a segment on water many months ago, um, because well water can be very much contamin contaminated, but I think a lot of people think, oh, it's a well, um, it's fine. But, um, there was a, um, I think I, I, I started ta um, talking about that because there was the story of the Wolverine shoe company over on the west side of Michigan and that they had contaminated everybody's wells because they threw out the treated uh, suede and leather scraps and it was just and they were dumping it into the river and these scraps were just lining the river so for months and years they were just leaching all these chemicals into the water and people were getting cancer um, dying at young ages um, how, well, you know, how old was this company? The Wolverine it, is the Wolverine shoe it, company. Yeah. So they? they were around for a really long time. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. You can look up the story. It was on M live and it's fascinating and it'll really piss you off because you're like, I can't believe that they would knowingly, they knowingly dumped all this stuff in the water. So, and those are the forever chemicals, right? So, um, so, and again, just looping it back to gut health is if you're exposing yourself to any of the forever chemicals. And I mean, that means like you buy a pair of shoes and you go outside and you take the spray, the waterproofing spray, that's a forever chemical. And what do you do when you go outside and you do that? You, you immediately go <coughs> because it, it, you can't help but to breathe it in. So the stuff is really, really toxic. And Teflon, you mentioned Teflon earlier. Yeah, we, yeah. 
Yeah. Wickershire. Yes. They knew they totally knew what they were doing. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that's crazy. Wolverine was around. We'll ask, um, we'll ask Bill about the glyphosate. He might know. And Bill, if you do know, you could, um, you could drop it in here too. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jay. Jay's going back and finding all of these things that I already talked about. That's great. I appreciate that very much. That's because Jay is awesome. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> I, need, I need Jay to come over and moderate my channel. <laughs> Love it. So anybody yeah. out there, are you having gut health? And what exactly is your gut health problem? Do you have ulcers? What is your gut health issue? Oh, no, we don't feed the grass anything. If you do, it grows. And yeah, you, then they have to mow it. That's right. Hey, robot gopher. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Hello, Wanda. I know you said something about ulcers early, earlier. So I'm just curious. I um, I do not have ulcers, but um, yeah, I have, I have some major stomach issues going on. And I just, it's so frustrating. Yeah. And it's, you know, it starts at the stomach. So if you have, if you have ulcers, um, that's where you have to be really careful about how you treat that. Like, um, most people that I work with, it's as simple as, um, giving them, um, acid betaine, which is basically uh, hydrochloric acid. So lifting the, you know, getting the, um, the acid levels up, um, lowering the pH. So more, but then more acid in the stomach so that it can kill off the bacteria. And then it also triggers the valves in the gut to open and close. So when people have, um, reflux of any kind, if the valve isn't closing, it's because there's not enough acid because there's no trigger to the brain that says we have to shut this valve and then churn the food and then put it through the rest of the system. So when you start to think about it like that, you're like, oh, that makes way more sense. Um, rather than just continuing to take more and more acid blockers, that valve is never going to close. And now you're not digesting food. And now you yeah. break the mesh of the gut and you get now what's called leaky gut and you start filtering out all the food particles into your bloodstream. And then that is where we get autoimmune issues and chronic illnesses. So, um, IBS, all of the, you know, fibromyalgia, all of those things. Now, when you have an ulcer, so, so that's pretty much the garden variety, right? It's super easy acid bug killers, um, uh, gut restoration, use aloe, deglycerized licorice. There's, you know, a handful of, a handful of things that we use as a cascade for that. But if you have an ulcer, gosh, you have an ulcer. Um, and sometimes that's H pylori and we have to come in and we have to kill the H pylori. You might have, um, you might have, uh, parasites. I mean, I saw somebody mentioned, uh, somebody asked a question way early on about parasites. And I think we were still on, um, on birthing and pooping in a bucket. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, if we do, uh, you know, it, that's so, so that is just a deeper dive and that really, um, you know, I always say to, if you're struggling, don't guess, just test. Um, because I want people to get a lot better, a lot faster instead of let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. Um, you know, testing is going to cost you anywhere from three to 600 bucks, depending on what we, we run. I mean, I could run a thousand dollars worth of tests, but I don't generally need to, um, somewhere in the ballpark of three to 600 gives me everything I need to know where to get you rolling and not guessing. And cause you've done enough guessing, you know, you've been all over Google looking for answers. So like, let's just stop that and just get you well, you know? Yeah. Well, you guys, I have been suffering from acid reflux ever since I was a kid. I've had nothing but acid reflux problems. Yeah. I remember when I was younger, the doctor prescribed me Zantac. Um, so I was on that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. They're not and, long -term medications. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just so many, I just have so many gut issues I've had like my entire life. So, um, <laughs> So then you did. So I had asked you if you had any issues before. Not, I thought you meant like IBS issues. No, <laughs> that, no. That. but that's all related. Right. Yeah. And, 
and that's really common. I want people to really hear that is that um, it's really common to not connect those dots, to separate the things, because what medicine has allowed us to do is um, talk about ourselves in pieces and parts. And we're not pieces and parts, right? You're a gallbladder, you're a stomach, you're a reflux, you're an IBS. That's not like you are a whole system. And those are signs that you've been having things going on your whole life, which is why you probably had gestational diabetes. And then it's probably why you had the, the issues, um, you know, after that. So, um, so, so don't take that lightly, like really understand that you're not a piece in part. And if you have to go to six different doctors for six different things, that's a problem right? So find somebody who's going to be able to look at you holistically and look at the root. There, there is a root cause to all of that. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to treat your, your lack of gallbladder and your reflux and your IBS. I know it's not IBS, but you know what I mean? You shouldn't have to yeah, separate I mean, that out. That's what they say it is. But when you go to the doctor, she gives you a speech about what IBS is. And it's such a general term. Like, yeah. You could just, you could Your just call is a angry. minor issue and she's going to call it IBS. There's no actual test for it. Like really, they just generalize it under IBS. So you had, you had diarrhea for a couple of weeks. Oh, you must have IBS. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's really not the case. And they don't <laughs> know that there is a test for it. There's multiple tests for it. They don't know how to treat it. There's, you know, it's, it is, it's really sad. So. Um, but that's why there's more and more functional medicine doctors like myself. I mean, I've been practicing for 25 years, but there's more and more people who are getting certified in functional medicine training, um, more and more people coming on board to uh, just to help people from a root cause perspective. Yeah. <sighs> Jay said, pulled up this. The Wolverine has been plagued by controversy since the PFAS containing waste from its old Rockford, Michigan tannery was found to have badly contaminated the local community's water supply. And they were all wells. So checking your water for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it'd be interesting to just go back in time with you, you know, and start putting the, you know, you're a puzzle now, right? And we can start yeah. taking all those pieces and, you know, creating the picture of what, what needs to be done. And then your son, the same thing. Um, he's the same puzzle. He's not a piece in part. Um, you know, he's not, you know, I'm not going to say he's not autistic, you know, whatever they gave him a diagnosis, but what are all of the things that need to be lined up to help reduce his, make his life better, improve his quality of life, yeah. Um, I know so many people that went the holistic route when they got that diagnosis and, and they, you give them such better quality of life. You, you take their pain away, you improve their digestion, you improve the impulse uh, behavior, you give them an opportunity to learn, you give them an opportunity to be functioning members of society, go to school, um, you know, but you have to have, you have to know the right things to do and the right places, people, places, and things, um, especially when, when you have those kinds of things going on. Well, I hope you guys are, this is all soaking in for you. Um, there's so many things I want to talk about, but I don't want to talk about them because I don't want people to think that I'm against going to the doctor or I'm, against medicines because I'm not, um, medicines are there for a purpose. They are good. Some medicines are really good for you <laughs> to help you. Um, but I think some medicines are just, um, offered to you just, well, oh, here, take this like, like candy. Yeah. Or something. Well, and that's the, that's the sad part is that, um, you know, uh, yeah, if you are in an emergency, you are going to want emergency medicine. Um, but most of medicine is, um, they don't have any other tools in their toolbox. And I hear it all the time. Why doesn't my doctor know this? Why doesn't my doctor tell me this? Um, why doesn't my doctor test for this? Cause they don't know. And, um, 
and kudos to the doctors who, when I do send my patients to back to their primary care physician and they say, yeah, uh, Dr. Ruffin did this for me and I no longer have digestive issues or my sinus issues went away or cured my gut, whatever it is. Um, and the doctor's like, wait, what is she doing? And they pay attention. I have had the reverse where they tell their patients, um, that's hogwash. Um, don't do that. Go back on the medication because they don't, they also don't, um, when you think about the money you spend on a medical uh, education, and then all of a sudden you find out 10, 20, 30 years later that it's doing nothing but making the majority of people sick. Yeah. And they've given you no other tools. Yeah. Like that's kind of, some people just want to bury their head in the sand and go, I, I can't, I don't even want to deal with that. Cause it's a whole nother education. Trust me. I've been doing it. You know? Um, I, I mean, I was I always, have, oh, I have somebody in our basement right now who is your friend. I've never met him before. Is his name just oh. Bill or is it Dr. Yeah. Bill? No, it's just Bill. Yeah. Just Bill. Okay. Yeah. Well, here he is. Hi. Here's Bill. <laughs> Bill's our chestnut guy. Yes. Well, hello, Corky. Uh, Hi. Hello, Dr. Paula. Thank you for having me this evening. And uh, yes, chestnuts. I'm glad to see so many enthusiastic people out there that can enjoy chestnuts. Yeah. So Bill is, I've been out to Bill's farm. I have, um, I have another video that I did out on his farm interviewing him and it was just beautiful. We talked about chestnuts and pawpaws and all the other nuts and perennial crops that he grows, black walnut. And, uh, so when, um, and then there's just exciting things going on in the chestnut world. I know that sounds, you know, people are like exciting things and chestnuts. So, um, so I thought we'd bring Bill on. And of course, when we look at how healthy chestnuts are, what a great combination. So, um, so yeah, so Bill's the guy. So he started a, um, uh, he's D Bill, were you one of the founding members of Chestnut Growers Inc? Yes, we do and have a marketing co-op here in Michigan that markets uh, chestnuts. Uh, and Michigan actually has more chestnut growers, more farms than any other state in the, in the nation, more than California. Uh, the co-op we've, yes, and the co-op has marketed in the past well over 200,000 pounds of uh, chestnuts. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's doing quite well. It's organized just like uh, a marketing co-op, so very similar to the uh, Florida citrus growers, uh, obviously on a much smaller scale, but uh, we have about 40 members. Um, and the co-op has done a very good job of, uh, of marketing, bringing these chestnuts in. We have a central location. They're sorted, they're washed, uh, graded, shipped out. Uh, so you'll find them in Myers. Uh, you'll a lot of uh, different grocery stores in the co-op we have a presence online so you can order online also and you guys are taking those i think when i first um met uh roger who's another one of the founding members uh and he said he had told me that you guys have this chestnut flower and i was like what and he brought me chestnut chips and then now you're like peeling and freezing them blister packing those so um, so talk a little bit about, um, how you guys started coming up with those options in order to not just have it be chestnuts op uh, roasting on an open fire at Christmas. <laughs> well, chestnuts are actually, actually a major crop around the world in many places. Uh, China produces, they're obviously the largest producer and the largest consumer of chestnuts and all throughout Europe, uh, a lot of different chestnut products are made. Uh, so we've traveled over there to a number of different uh, meetings and uh, learned about chestnut flour, the, the, the parade, the creme de marron, and the, and the candies. Uh, uh, Wait, chestnut puree? Lattes. How did I miss chestnut, chestnut puree? puree? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> very well known, and you can buy it in, in grocery stores over there. And oh, over there, crazy. not here. I was like, you can get it here at specialty stores. Okay. But it's all imported. 
that that was one item we we have talked about that uh, uh, to to make, but uh, you know that takes a bit of investment and in, in chestnuts and for the equipment. The equipment's all available. Italy makes a great deal of equipment. We have uh, in Michigan State University as a chestnut peeler uh, from Boema Company over in Italy. A line that we peel the chestnuts. So that type of equipment is available uh, because that is a industry in a lot of these other countries. Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, all grow chestnuts. Turkey grows chestnuts. Uh, so they're, they're grown around the world uh, now in South America. Chile has got quite a bit of chestnut growing uh, and certainly in uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, and in Japan. So they, uh, it is a major crop in, in many places of the world, just not here in uh, the United States. Huh. So how long does it take to grow like a chestnut tree to the point where they actually produce chestnuts? You, if you have a good grafted tree, it will actually start to bear probably in that, oh, a lot of times in four or five years, sometimes even uh, sooner. We generally say uh, for a positive cash flow, you're lo probably looking in more of that eight to 10 years to get enough production where you'll have a positive cash flow. But certainly for the homeowner, for a backyard tree, you'll get production on a good tree relatively quickly. Awesome. Um, what are the health benefits then of chestnuts? Um, I, obviously, it's an, another alternative flower, which is way better than what most are. So what are the health benefits to chestnuts? Well, I'll certainly let Dr. Paula uh, answer that. But chestnuts are more like a cereal that grows on a tree, more like a potato. Okay. If you've had chestnuts, you know, the entire inside is, is the nut meat. And cooked, it's more like the consistency of a potato, a little more like a sweet potato, actually. Oh, wow. Uh, and it'll have that sweetness to it. And certainly roasting is one way of utilizing it. But you can use soups, put it in soups. Uh, it's, it's made into a lot of different uh, types of products. You go through Italy. You can find uh, everything from pasta and breads and, and desserts. You'll find beers. You'll find liqueurs. Uh, it's utilized in a lot of different ways. And uh, certainly the health benefits are... Are, are very good. So That's I'll interesting. Let Dr. Paula I've never had a chestnut before. I don't think. You haven't? Oh, no. Chestnuts roasting on the open fire. I mean, I've yeah. heard of it, and yeah, it's a, in a song, but I just yes. never, <laughs> just never well, you're like, had it. You're like most Americans. That, uh, <laughs> you're familiar with it through the song. Yeah. And never yeah. actually have had one. But uh, they are very good and, and very... Uh, 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 useful in a lot of different dishes. It makes an excellent uh, uh, soup. Chestnut soup is a, you know, a, a great soup, particularly in the winter time. And uh, what was me. that? So when, when I was down and you guys were processing the pawpaws and that chestnut flour came in and that was, was that from Italy? Cause that was so, so I have the roasted chestnut flour and I think I have plain chestnut flour and then Roger gave me a little bag of that and it was so sweet. So I was really intrigued about the different types of flour. You know, like, like why was that so sweet? And that was just straight chestnut flour. There was nothing added to it. Right. The, uh, we make uh, a uh, roasted chestnut flour. It's kind of a specialty and actually, you know, sorry, the only ones in the world making that. Uh, we had some flour uh, come in from Chile. And uh, that was a good quality flour. And we have certainly made flour with some of uh, our own chestnuts that we grow also. Our problem is, is that we can't get enough production. We don't have enough farms out there. We don't have enough trees growing. Uh, and we don't have enough chestnut production to, to meet demand. Uh, we import uh, probably 90% of the chestnuts consumed in this country from overseas, mostly European. Uh, so there's a great potential to grow our own chestnuts here and expand production, expand acreage, and, and uh, farmers can make a, a, a good living off. Uh, a, you don't have to have a huge uh, 
planting of chestnuts. Uh, most chestnuts plantations are probably in that five to 10 acres or less. Uh, so there's no really large, huge uh, planting of, of chestnuts like you would find almonds or pistachios or, or walnuts uh, out west. Interesting. Zach, so um, yeah, so if people are going to grow chestnuts and they don't have a lot of land, how many trees could they grow? You know, how, what's the smallest space that somebody could grow and maybe have enough in eight to 10 years to have for, um, for like to make some money to have for production? It's around 80 trees per acre. You can figure something along that line. So however you, you know, want to approach that. Uh, and there's a lot of resources out there. Michigan State University, go to you know, msu.edu and type in chestnuts. A lot of information there on that. Uh, and the growing condition and the site preparation, uh, air drainage, soil pH, soil types. And there's a lot of good organizations out there too. Uh, there's the Michigan uh, Fruit and Nut Growers. There's the northern nut growers are certainly the chestnut uh, michigan midwest chestnut producers there's a lot of organizations out there so anybody i would advise anybody who was really thinking about that seriously for some type of of uh, income uh to uh, you know get your ducks in a row and explore this and some of these organizations are, are very good at michigan state university the partnership with them in the chestnut industry has proven absolutely invaluable. We would not have an industry here growing chestnut but if it were not for Michigan State University and all the research and help that they have given us. Yeah, because you guys got the, the grant for the machinery, right? Or was that the pop yes. pods? Am I getting that mixed up? No, uh, that's, that's another, that was another uh, a grant. But yes, uh, over the years, uh, partnering with Michigan State University, uh, been a lot of grants have been uh, received uh, for equipment, for research, for trees. Uh, so whenever you're, whenever you go to another state and, you know, another nut grower meeting, uh, when you tell them you're from Michigan, they always say, well, you're very lucky. you got Michigan State University there behind you. I said, yes, we, we know that. And do consider ourselves very fortunate, and that's why we have this uh, chestnut industry in, in the state. So they haven't worked with other chestnut growers around the country then, or was that just something that you guys went and started working with them to try to propagate this crop? And they were like, yeah, let's do it. Well, there's definitely some outreach, and there's some other places around, like Missouri University of Missouri has been doing some chestnut work uh and, and, and rutgers uh and, and some of the other ones uh michigan state university probably the main one and of course land grant college it is you know trying to support the residents of, of the states and the farmers of the states you know that's sort of their their guideline on that but certainly the information that they have uh have published is, is available and you know, I have gone with a number of the researchers around to different meetings, and they'll certainly have presented papers, you know, all over this country and uh, quite a bit of the world. Interesting. Um, and how long ago did you guys start that, the start CGI? We started that about 20 years ago. Okay. So pretty uh, young, really, that. right? Yes. Yeah. It is. And it, it, uh, you know, growing pain, certainly, but uh, no, it has done very well and very well for the members. As I said, there's about 40 members. We have quite a few other people that are starting to grow chestnuts and have planted chestnuts. Uh, to be a member of the co-op, uh, you have to contribute to the co-op. So people don't join the co-op until they actually have start having some production. Okay. Uh, the, the Midwest uh, Chestnut Producers Council, that's sort of the uh, educational arm. Uh, and so the membership in that, there's a lot of growers in there that are are starting in to grow, starting to plant, and a lot of information. We have uh, annual meetings uh, 
in Michigan State University. Um, a lot of updates from engineering, uh, a lot of entomology. Uh, so a lot of current research. And that's why I would certainly, anybody who's interested in that, uh, join these organizations, come to some of the meetings, and you will find out uh, there is a lot of information out there to grow this crop. And anytime we try to get a potential grower out there, you know, we want to make sure that they're successful. So it's like, what is your growing conditions? You know, what's, what type of soils, what type of slope, where are you, what zone, what USDA zone? Uh, then you can make some recommendations on growing whether uh, the Chinese cultivars, the Europeans, or the European uh, Japanese hybrids. So, like any other crop, uh, a number of different things to consider uh, to make certain that uh, you can have some success. Is one chestnut tree better than the other? <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. It's a little bit. Uh, because there are so many different cultivars and different growing conditions, but it's, it's a little bit like uh, asking a group of, of uh, 10 wine tasters, what's their favorite wine? Everybody will have their favorite, these are their, their favorite cultivars, the one that does best for them. And you have certainly different variations in, in growing conditions and climates, uh, not only around the state of Michigan, but certainly uh, all over uh, the country. So in some places, uh, other particular cultivars will do much better uh, than in other places. Missouri can certainly grow some cultivars that don't do very well for us. Uh, and so that was some of the research, of course, of Michigan State University to try to find some of the cultivars, some of the varieties that grow best uh, here in Michigan that will perform and uh, farmers can have uh, success with. Interesting. So is CGI just Michigan farmers then? Or is that it is. Well, it, at this point, it is, though it does not have to be. We did have a member from Ohio. They, they retired one production. But no, it, uh, it can be uh, here from the Midwest, though we only have one receiving station. So the thing is, if you're going to bring your chestnuts into uh, CGI, the receiving station, is in uh, Clarksville, which is halfway between Lansing and, and uh, Grand Rapids. It's a Michigan State University field station. Oh. So if you're if you're going to grow uh, out of state in Ohio, and there's there's co-ops in Ohio, and a number of growers in Ohio and, and all over, it's a long ways to bring your chestnuts because we don't have multiple receiving stations. It's just that one central one. So probably the largest reason is that uh, it's a, a bit of a ways to drive. So if you are going to do that, you know, you would want to make sure that uh, you're bringing a large quantity. At, at, at yeah, so yeah, I, that's really interesting. I did not know that. I was thinking it was just the Michigan farmers. So yeah. Um, and I love, you know, I've always loved chestnuts since I was a little girl. And uh, Corky, we have to get you some chestnuts. Yeah, I've never had and, them before. So yeah, they're, I mean, yeah, they're really, they're interesting because they, um, I would say their consistency is uh, almost like they're a little starchy, I guess. Right? Would you say, Bill? They're a little starchy, but they're yeah, sweet. a bit. A bit like a potato, and then you know how yeah, a, potato, a bit like yeah, but uh, but uh, will sweeten um, in yeah. time, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the same way the chestnuts; those yeah. uh, those starches, those carbohydrates, start changing to sugar, so they age a little bit. They'll certainly get much sweeter. And they're so good, and they um, I would say there's a, they're a little oily too, so there are, there is some good healthy fats in there. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, and then one of the things too, which you know, they just, they pack such a punch nutritionally. So they're high in folate, which um, folate is brain and nervous system. You know, we all need folate. And of course, you know, it, when women are pregnant, they, they are told immediately to increase their folate levels. Well, they really should be 
having high levels of folate for many, many months prior to getting pregnant um, to make sure that they have sufficient folate to grow life. And uh, so that's really one of the key nutrients. And then as we get older, folate's really important for brain health. So, um, so it, you know, this would be the fact that you can now get some kind of chestnut, whether it's the whole chestnut, whether it's the flour, um, the chips, or, you know, some, if you, you can get chestnut in some variety year round means that you now have access to this incredibly nutrient dense crop. Um, <clears throat> one of the things too, is that it has a couple of, um, uh, so it has lutein in it. And I think it's, is it Zeanthony? There's a couple of, of, uh, compounds in there that are excellent for eye health. So oh. what's really important to know about that is that when you eat those uh, compounds, when you eat foods that have those compounds, it actually helps protect your eyes from the blue lights, right? So I'm staring into a, a little LED right now, which is horrible for me. So I probably should have downed some chestnuts before I, I did this. But <laughs> And you're sitting in the dark. I think you, you've got the right idea. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, the dog's barking. Paula's like, Bentley says hi. Bentley's saying hi to everybody. Uh, so yeah, so there's, so, so when you, when you look at, to me, I always think what are foods that you can be eating that are nutrient dense? And a lot of people have problems with when, when they're, you know, they, oh, I can't control my appetite or I'm starving. It's probably because you're not getting foods that have enough nutrients in them. And um, chestnuts are also that food that feels like you're not supposed to eat it. Like they have this like decadence to them for, for me personally, I'm like, oh my gosh. And, uh, and so if you can just, you, if you can get them and, and they even sell them at Costco and I, I don't know who does that one bill, but they sell them in pre-shelled in a bag and you can just rip it open and snack right, you know, right from the bag. Um, It'll and it's just a probably What's that? Probably, probably Italy. Italy oh, think, will do a number of that. Yeah. Uh, Spain does some of that, but probably most of that coming in in this country is from Italy. And they were the and, big ones. Uh, mm -hmm, the yeah. big Italian type ones. Yeah. Because we we have a, a pick. A lot of times we have pick your own folks that come out here, and we grow both Chinese and and European. And it's kind of interesting because the the Asians, the Chinese, we get some Koreans and Japanese. They always want the Chinese. They want the little ones. And then the, when the Europeans come out, uh, they want more of the Italian, the larger ones. Mm. You know, we'll get Bosnians, Romanians, a lot, uh, certainly a lot of Italians uh, from all over. And it's part of their culture. So they are very pleased and they're very happy to find that chestnuts growing here in Michigan and in some places they can go out and, and pick them. So we, we have a lot of pickers that come in, uh, in the fall for, for, uh, to pick chestnuts and it's part of their culture. Uh, if you go over to Europe and walk down the streets in the fall and buy the, a lot of the stores in which they'll have big window displays uh, here in, in this country, when you, in the fall, you'll see pumpkins in windows. And you'll see Indian corn, and, and uh, over there you will see chestnuts, and you'll see chestnut burrs uh, and chestnut products. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're going past a, a pharmacy or a hardware or a lingerie store. There'll be chestnuts in there in, in the display window. Lingerie and chestnuts. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure how that mixes, but uh, they. Uh, They'll, they'll be getting a display store window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, and you know, that's the other thing too, is like, they're really, they're very filling. When I was growing up, my mom, the, the only time I ate chestnuts was at Thanksgiving and my mom would get chestnuts and she'd roast them and put them in bread dressing. That was the only wow, time right. we ever ate them. Right. So I think they've gone from very this, true. you know, yeah, they, they've gone from this, this, thing that was, had a very specific use at a very specific time. And now the, the possibilities are, are endless with it. Do they lose any of their health benefits or properties once they're roasted? That's a very good question. 
<laughs> no, no. They certainly they certainly <laughs> gather a lot of flavor and taste, anyways. That's all you. That's I, I all would we not, need. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I would not think they would would lose very much at all, if if, if any. Yeah, I mean, do normal nuts do? I mean, I don't know. Do cashews and stuff do once they're roasted? Do peanuts and stuff? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good I idea. Know. I, would I, I know it, not, but I don't. They I don't can become know. less oily, like you know, when you roast a nut, you're you're going to take some of the oil out. Um, which the you know the oils have major benefit, but I don't know if they would necessarily lose all of the other health benefits. Hard to say. Yeah, I, know, I know some things. Once you cook them down, they lose. They mm -hmm. don't lose all their benefits, but they lose a big portion of them. Mm -hmm. So, well, chestnuts are mostly water. They're well over fifty percent water, unlike other nuts. They're more like a potato. Potato yeah. or cereal that grows on the trees. Interesting. And there are certain, you go to like China, particularly in the rural areas, they will depend on that in mountainous areas as a major crop. They'll harvest that and they'll certainly dry that down and rehydrate it and utilize that as a major food source. Uh, and and uh, around the world, they'll do that. A lot of times in Europe, because a little more affluent, it's looked more as a, uh, as a treat, as, as something... Uh, not so much as you're going to eat that every day as a wonderful little treat now and then. Yeah. I got a question about the nut in general because I know, like with almonds, they need um they need bees to survive. Basically, does chestnuts have the same issues as almonds do, as far as getting pollinated? And pollinated, uh, they're mostly wind pollinized. It's oh, sort of okay. like a, a birch because of the catkins. Now, now, there is a little controversy. Some people think they're more insect uh, pollinized, but it's not so much with the honeybee. It'll be other insects, and they produce a lot of pollen. If you go out into a chestnut orchard, and they, they blossom around the 4th of July, uh, they have a very distinctive uh, aroma. Uh, so if you're walking along and you smell that, uh, you'll know there's a chestnut tree around some. Okay. Uh, and it really fills the air. Uh, I've got neighbors now, uh, oh, quarter, half a mile away. And you know, what is that smell? What, what, what is that? And because the, the flowers produce the flowers, the chestnut flowers. The wow. It so just, really, just fills the air. So, really, chestnut flower would be a better alternative to almond flour, for instance, because almonds are harder to grow, almonds are harder to produce. To produce. So if chestnuts are just e easily pollinated by the wind, I mean, that's a huge yeah. thing. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to bring in a lot of the European uh, honeybees. Yeah, and that'd be a great by. alternative flower. You know, that's that's amazing. Yep. There was, a ma there was a major industry here in this country for chestnuts for the American chestnut. That's a, that's a story all unto itself. But... Uh, <laughs> That, that there was, with the introduction of the chestnut blight around the beginning of the previous century, about 1903, uh, the chestnut blight came into this country and in about 40 years pretty much wiped out the American chestnut. At uh, that time, it was about one of every uh, five trees eastern, east of the Mississippi River was American chestnuts. And so you read accounts of when our uh, forebears uh, came to this country that game was so abundant well it was because of the american chestnut it produced an annual crop of uh, of nuts a very very healthy nuts uh, oaks and a lot of other walnuts a lot of times are being biennial bears they bear every other year and so you can get populations of wildlife build up and crash and build up and crash now with the american chestnut or certainly the european and the chinese they bear every year. There'll be a little fluctuation, but you always will get a crop. So it supported a lot of wildlife, and kept that wildlife very healthy because it was such a nutritious nut. So we were probably about five generations removed from people really knowing what the chestnut is. Uh, but at one time back in the 1800s, it, it was a major industry and you would find chestnuts 
in in all the cities. They would bring them in and sell them in the stores or roast them on the street corners. Uh, but uh, because so of the blight, is there a it, bug or something that goes after these chestnut trees that causes them? Well, to of, of the American chestnut, it's it's a it's a fungus that came oh. in. Now because it evolved, it probably came in with the Chinese chestnut. Uh, so that tree that just the Chinese evolved with that blight so that is resistant or almost immune to that blight but when it came to this country it, the American chestnut which is a different species uh, had never seen that blight and it went <coughs> right through them uh, a little bit like uh, when the Europeans brought smallpox uh, to this country uh, and, and particularly down through Mexico and South America and it just devastated the the native population because they'd never seen smallpox and it was just the same with the american chestnut very interesting so then how did they get the other varieties here to um i guess you know be, oh be the other propagating? yeah okay well <laughs> of course that's probably one of the reasons that uh, the uh, blight got here but uh oh you know active sign would types of exchange and, and cultivars uh, to, to, to bring in. And, and now we bring them in, of course, under quarantine. Uh, and then uh, once they're out of quarantine, of course, and proven safe, we can grab those different cultivars. And some, you know, climates around the world, some of the cultivars will do very well here in Michigan. And uh, others will do well more in like an Oregon or California situation. Uh, particularly like some of the southern European types, the Moroni is, is one of those. Uh, that does not that particular one does not do too well here in Michigan, but some of the French hybrids certainly do very well and produce a very large nut and a little more disease resistant than some of the ones that we're growing, particularly to you know some of the soil borne diseases like Phytophthora uh, and, and others. So, do you find it's better to? Do you, do you have just a, a small variety that you're wanting to propagate rather than try to get multiple different varieties? Just just focus on a few to to really get to the industry to get to market. Well, some of the ones that the state uh, has has grown and has proven to do well here. Some of the the French hybrids like uh, Precaution Gould, Mary Gould. Uh, uh, the Marsol, there's a series of these, uh, and they do well here. They're, they're hardy, and they produce a very good tasting nut. And uh, the, the trial plantings have, have shown that. And there's a few of those, few growers trying those. So those are the ones that we're looking at, trying to propagate those and and get some more trees online to increase acreage and and uh, and, and increase the industry. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating to think that, um, like, I, I, I'm like, hey, I know the guy that's like propagating a, a freaking industry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> if, I think it's thing. really, I think chestnuts are really cool. If that's the case, yeah. they're easy to pollinate and and stuff like that. I think, I think they're pretty awesome. I think more people need to get into them. More people need to start growing these trees. Um, it's nice well, to have alternative food sources out there versus the mainstream ones. I know almonds are pretty mainstream, but they require a lot to grow. So if you can grow chestnuts, why not? Oh, you know? absolutely. And, and they, they give a good return. Chestnuts will probably produce in about the, uh, 10 years or so someplace in that, uh, Oh, you should be getting three to four, maybe 5,000 pounds per acre. Uh, we've had growers get upwards in a good year of 6,000 pounds per acre. Uh, the co-op has been paying as a wholesale base price uh, between that two and three dollars a pound. Uh, they've been increasing over the years. And so that, uh, you know, a fairly good return on, on, on a small acreage basis uh, for a farmer. It just takes a little longer to get into that than, of course, growing an annual crop. Yeah. But well, and but what you were there, saying when um, 
when I came out to visit your farm and you were talking about the the black walnut that um, that your dad planted as part of, uh, you know, that that was supposed to be the, um, you know, for the next generation. Right. So what can you what can you do now? So he planted that and that clearly was going to be for the next generation. But I think um, uh, chestnuts are that crop that people can plant now for uh, to actually earn some money on as well, right? To, to have a legacy that's going to, to start to bring income for, and, and it's not going to have to be 50 years before they see um, anything growing, right? Right. We have a lot of new uh, members at all our meetings we've been having uh, for all these different groups. It's been very encouraging to see a lot of new members, uh, particularly younger members in their 20s and 30s. Uh, because at that point in time, you certainly have ample, ample time to get a orchard up and going and uh, uh, be profitable. So it's, it's more and more people are getting interested in it. And one of the reasons that we're working hard on, on propagation of trees is that really right now what is limiting the industry is the availability of good quality trees. I mean, if you look at apples or look at almonds, those are produced in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of trees by, by large major nurseries. Uh, the nurseries we've talked to in the past, the large ones, because the chestnuts are too small. They don't want to. Do it. We had a, originally started with a nursery out in California. It was producing the one cultivar that a lot of our growers grow, which is colossal. But it was a very small portion of their business. They uh, said they only produced probably between... 10 to 15,000 trees a year. Uh, and that was basically, they had somebody there that was really interested in it. But they produced a lot of the other trees, the pistachios and, and uh, walnuts, and then produced them by the hundreds of thousands. And so they just decided that it was too small to bother with, so they just quit propagating and quit growing chestnuts. So there isn't any major nursery that's growing those in huge quantities that would create an industry. So that's why we're trying to look at different methods and different ways of uh, trying to get some more trees out there so that the industry can grow and prosper. So do they, do people then order trees direct from you? Do you guys ship um, all over the country or, or where do they? We, we do. Uh, and there's several other nurseries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just take that off. <laughs> take that offline. Here in the office. Was that an actual phone? Calls, was that an actual phone? That, that was an actual phone. I never yeah. heard one of that in a long time. Was that a rotary dial phone, Bill? <laughs> nice try, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she came out and asked, "Do we have to ride horses back in the field?" I said, "No, we can take a golf <laughs> a carriage. We needed a horse and carriage." To right. Go back here, yeah. right. <laughs> he he actually has motorized vehicles on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. door plumbing. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I did just drop um, in the chat, so I. I, uh, cause where I met Bill was at the, so I'm, I belong to uh, Michigan fruit and nut growers association, which Bill, I think is your founding member of that group as well. Right. Uh, no, but my father was. Oh, okay. Well, because that, that was, come on. That was, that was founded back in the early fifties. Was it really? I didn't know it was, yeah. it was, had been around that long. Yes. Okay, okay, did any of you guys out there have any questions for Bill as far as chestnuts are concerned or any of the health benefits for pa Dr. Paula? Um, yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that that they can actually protect you from the blue light, which, you know, we're exposed to all day long with, you know, all the UV light and our phones. Think about how much you're on the phone. Um you know, that anytime you can have food that is protective, neuroprotective like that, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, I didn't, I had no idea. That's yeah, amazing. yeah, really, really cool. So, um, yeah, I, I had seen some, some, I saw some, 
uh, somebody was saying that they they're over in the western southwest corner of Michigan and they have the biggest chestnut orchard over there. Do you know who that is? We have several growers over in that area, mm -hmm. over there on the on the on the west side of the state. Yeah, uh, I knew there was a few. Yeah, yeah, there's one fellow who's been been planting. I think he has now around twenty five or thirty acres, and they're they're coming online now. We have a really really big question. Kenny Wood says, "Can you really roast them on an open?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, you yes, can. You can. <laughs> that's, that's traditional. Uh, I'll have to send you pictures of them roasting on your open fire. But you, you, can, you can boil them, you can microwave them, and so you cook them, you can cook them in a lot of different ways. But one one thing about chestnuts, you will read, you know, put chestnuts, uh, you can roast them in the microwave, leave one or two that you don't. Uh, are. You have to, anytime you're going to roast a chestnut, you got to make a little split in the shell simply because there's a lot of water in there. When that heats up, that creates steam and you have to allow that steam to escape or it will explode. And the old uh, song that said chestnuts pop, pop, popping, uh, the fire will, they pop. They, they do more than pop. They actually explode. So <laughs> if you start roasting them in, in the microwave, uh, make sure that you do uh, put a little X or a lot of times what we call a little smile, a little slit so that that steam can escape yeah. and uh, as the chestnut is, is cooking. Wickershire did. Learn the hard way. Go ahead. Wickershire basically had a question. Is that I heard of almond milk. Is there a chestnut nut milk? You can make a milk out of any nut. Mm -hmm. You can make it out of almonds. You can make it out of cashews any of those nuts um and i'll well, bet because chestnuts not, are, are yeah you, you can do it chestnuts are a higher in water content than than other nuts uh they don't have they're more more carbohydrates in there so they are a little bit more like a potato uh so it's not quite as easy to do that as you would other other types of nuts or or to make a, a, a nut butter you can certainly make a puree uh, out of them but uh yeah, you can, but it's it's not quite as easy. When somebody was asking earlier, and it looks like this question or comment has made it back around about um, easy, easy to peel, because I, I know also um, in the past when I've bought them and tried to roast them, you know, there's an inner, so there's the shell and then there's an inner, um, uh, like a- Pedicle. Like a skin. Pedicle. Pedicle, yeah. And Pedicle. so- so what makes that difficult to get off or what makes it easier to get off of there? A lot of times roasting them will expand that and make that pedicle come off a lot easier. One of the easiest ways to do this uh, is to cut your chestnuts right in half, sort of along the equator line and place them upside down on a paper plate and put them in the microwave. Now, that's not as bromatic as roasting on the open fire, but it's quick and it's easy. And uh, generally, after about a minute or two in the microwave, uh, the chef pedicle will just lift right off. Uh, I've got a, I've got an eight-year-old granddaughter, and she loves chestnuts. And whenever she comes out, and particularly during the season when we're picking up chestnuts, she always, can we roast some chestnuts, Grandpa? So we'll get that and roast them in the microwave because it's quick and easy and they're then they're very tasty and nutritious that way also. Yeah, when you when you got kids that'll just gobble them up like that, that's, you know, get get them get them eating that that healthy crop early, you know. Yeah. And valuing valuing that, you know, she went and Sorry, I love that from a legacy perspective is that you know, she's out there and she's picking and she's preparing and she's learning how to grow it and then what to do when she eats it. And, and that connection, I think, with kids to the earth. Well, I mean, that was you. You took over your, you know, your dad's farm and your son um, farms with you. And um, what is it, five, five generations now? I, I lost count. Seven? I'm the fifth generation. Uh, my the grandkids will be the seventh generation, yes. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It's amazing. And awesome. uh, my son is doing a very good job with, with 
you know, with his daughter, my, my granddaughter, because this fall now he was uh, not only uh, teaching the value of chestnut and how good they are and nutritious and how tasty, but basically tasty, is that uh, paying her to go out and pick up chestnuts so we would have them up here to sell. So she's going out picking chestnuts, realizing that her labor, her work, she can make money, and then she'll have money to be able to go out and, and buy what she wants. Uh, so it's it's a good learning uh, learning process. Do a lot of the places have a you pick business, or is that something unique to you? No, there's a number of them that do have that. Uh, some of our orchards are certainly just further out, away from urban centers. And then some people just simply don't want to bother with that. Uh, never, we never, I never planned on uh, having so much pick your own. We always had some come in and pick your own, but then the, the rest uh, we would sell through the co-op. Well, COVID hit and all of a sudden everybody wanted to get outside. So that fall, people started showing up from all over. I mean, we had folks coming in from Kentucky, from nice. Minnesota to pick chestnuts and a lot of course, Detroit and Chicago and a lot of around, you know, Lansing and, and Michigan State University. But it was all of a sudden, they just started showing up. And ever since then, we, we sell probably 90% uh, for a pick your own. Uh, it's, it's surprising. And the only thing we ever do for advertising is simply post on Facebook. Uh, when they're ripe and evidently by word of mouth and they just people have been coming in and on the weekends it gets very very busy around here um kathleen moran asks are there uh do, are the the health benefits similar with the different varieties i yes you know i'm not sure of any studies that would have you know, compared Chinese to European to to uh, uh, you know, Americans and, and or the Japanese, but I would think they would all be pretty similar. I mean, it would be a little bit like I would think apples. You know, they probably will vary a little bit, and they certainly will vary in taste and, and what somewhat. But I would think I would think uh, they would be very similar. But I'm not really aware of any studies that have ever tried to compare the nutritional value of a Chinese. Uh, chestnut, uh, the European chestnut. Interesting. Scrolling through for questions here. Yeah, that's what I was doing too. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, did you say there's big? So, Wanda asked, I've never seen any as big as a tangerine. Where can I get some of those? The, the actual nut <laughs> isn't that big, is it? Do you have no? Yeah, no, about so, the largest, large, right? you'll. Yeah, large as you'll have, but we, we generally save so many per pound. So once you start getting uh, to the really large chestnuts, you're generally looking at about a 15 to 20 per pound. Occasionally you'll get a few, you know, you're looking at almost an ounce for a really large chestnut. Uh, 15 to 20 chestnuts per pound? Per pound. That's oh, yeah, a okay. really, really large one. Uh, you yeah, know, okay. Uh, a, most, a lot of them will be more in that uh, probably... 25 to uh, 40 per pound. And because of the cultural differences in the way they were raised, you know, we'll have that I was saying the Asians like the smaller ones because that's what they grew up with. Uh, and the Europeans like the larger ones, uh, the two different species. Generally, the European is a little larger than the Chinese. Uh, yeah, nutrition, I don't know, but I'm assuming they're basically the same. And once they're cooked, the flavor is is the same on those also. Um, Jay was saying s smoke with the leftover chestnut peels. I never thought about that. Have you ever tried that? Smoking with it? We've, we visited uh, several different uh, co-ops, grower co-ops uh, over there in, in, in Europe, and particularly in, in France. And there was one co-op that was, uh, they would... Uh, dry the chestnuts down and then they would kind of shuck them so you'd have the dry nut which you can then grind into flour and what they would do it once they got the shell off then uh, for the next batch of chestnuts they would burn those shells as a fuel uh, so you know they were utilizing it 
all total. But yeah, the shells will, you know, once they're dried down, they, they certainly will burn. Yeah. I, I bet you it would smell good, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How delicious. <laughs> and I'm thinking chestnut smoked meat. Ooh. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Kenny was, Kenny's still hung up on the um, chestnut lingerie, the market for a chestnut lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was <laughs> sort of like the pumpkin in the hardware story. Yeah. <laughs> By the hardware, not the pumpkin. <laughs> and I don't know if I've ever seen him with chestnuts with Miracle Whip, but. Uh, <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> bringing back the miracle whip yeah <laughs> you know what the worst part about for me is i don't know when this ever came into play but they used to make jello molds jello whatever with oh, cottage yeah. cheese yes <sighs> oh. <laughs> oh, disgusting jello oh. cottage cheese oh <laughs> we gotta use use lime jello oh so that was one right. of the things yeah. Yeah. On church dinners as a kid. Yeah, there, there'd always be a lot of that. Uh, oh, gross. <laughs> uh, Shawnee said chestnut is the only nut with vitamin C with a question mark. I don't know. They are really high in vitamin C. I don't know if it's the only nut with vitamin C. Yeah. I mean, they are loaded I don't, I don't, yeah, with nutrients. Sure. Um, Very healthy nut. I don't know. I mean, they... Yeah. they they support populations around the world, and obviously, they support a tremendous amount of wildlife. No, I'm wildlife. curious. I'm going to really them. love them. Sure. And as a grower, that's well, one that's of the when... things that you'll have to solve is keeping the wildlife out of your chestnut orchard. Well, is that why you so the the chickapins, right? So that was are those? Do you plant those personally around the? chestnut orchard to keep the wildlife away from the chestnuts uh no but to basically uh it, the chickapin is a, a small chestnut it's a true chestnut but they're very tiny uh and there's one nut per bird and generally with regular chestnuts there are three nuts per bird uh no the allegheny chickapin they grow that so we can have a seed source uh but that's very good for wildlife uh, also and you'll find that down to Appalachia a lot uh, up in the mountains. It's just a different species of chestnut. There are a number of different species of chestnuts around the world. Uh, we generally focus on, you know, the major, the Chinese, the European, and uh, uh, the Japanese and hybrids thereof. But there are certainly other species of them. I'm sorry. I was looking at all the different nuts. I'm typing them in the side chat. <laughs> There's quite a few that have vitamin C, and some of them I was kind of surprised. So, what recipes does everyone have? So, um, CGI, which I think Jay posted the link for that. You guys have recipes on the website, don't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's recipes there, and there's also recipes. There'll be certainly recipes uh, on the another little. Uh, a company that's working with chestnuts is Treeborn. Uh, oh, okay. And that recipe's on there. Uh, and the site's under construction, but soon they'll, that'll be up with shopping baskets. So uh, you'll be able to get flour uh, right there and order it online. Okay, so that's not live yet? Uh, no. Okay. Probably the beginning of the first of the year. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, everything takes time. Oh, there we go. They put it through seed, they put in seeds in with this too. But a hazelnut, chai, um, pistachios, walnuts, pecans. I love pine nuts, those are oh, my favorites. Oh, yeah. wow, I love uh -huh. them so much. I just do. So Back good. in Asia, Brazil, and cashews all have vitamin C in them, guys. They need okay. to add, they need to add chestnut to that, right? Well, hazelnuts are very oh, good. Yeah. We grow hazelnuts also, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, well, and seeds themselves are so high in nutrients, and I, I wonder too. Um, so a lot of seed, a lot of people can't do seeds because the the lectins in them. So now I'm wondering, and I didn't go deeper. I should have gone deeper on the chestnut. Is because um, some of those seeds 
the only way people can eat them is if they're sprouted. Um, but I'm wondering if chestnuts are different. Well, chestnuts. because you're not eating the, the, the shell mm. on chestnuts where you know, okay. the seeds you are. So yeah. and I think that's the, the higher source of it there. So you're just eating the, the inside meat itself, which is a lot more like a potato than, than a walnut or an almond. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. So coconut, chestnut, macadamia, pecans, pistachios, walnuts, flax, hemp, pumpkin, and chia are lowest in lectins. So yeah. So people who would have any kind of um, issue with nuts would probably be more likely to be able to um, to eat the the chestnuts. People yeah. have allergies to nuts. You know, chestnut isn't a true nut. Genetically more of a of, of a fruit in, inside, uh, so people have allergies to peanuts or nuts. Uh, generally, have no problem with chestnuts whatsoever because they don't contain those same compounds and they are a, a true nut. It makes me want to go out say chestnuts, like cashews and nuts and all that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm so hungry for nuts right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, like you don't see cashew flour. Like I think, um, I think the only well the only flour you find is uh almond flour i've made walnut like a walnut meal out of black walnut and regular walnut for like pumpkin pie but the chestnut flour it's like true flour it's not like you know it's it's not a meal um like almonds and and um, walnuts would make so if you really want to cook something and you want flour you know a gluten-free flour you're going to get what you want from the um, the cashew flour, and it's it's so lovely. Now yeah, I really want to. Flour. I'm making crepes tomorrow. I'm making. Okay. <laughs> I'm making chestnut crepes. This tomorrow. is so horrible, but I love. Okay, so I love shrimp. So my mom and I have been obsessed with Panda Express because <laughs> they have walnut, candy walnut shrimp. Oh God, it's so good. I've. Oh my God. Oh it's my God. The first time I had it, I was like, "What is this? This is it's magnificent." <laughs> My mom it's, felt the same way. And she's like, we have to go back. Like two days later, we went back. <laughs> it's, it's like candy for dinner. Oh, it's so delicious. Yeah. I haven't had that in years. <laughs> well, one of the things with, with chestnuts, of course, the flour is very fine. A little coarser grind on that. And it's a lot like panko. And so it makes a very oh. good coating for fish, for, for any types of meat to, to oh. fry up. Oh, I think you did give me it. Didn't you give me a bag of that? I think I used it I, yeah. on, oh, I, I did, I used it on walleye and it was ah, outstanding. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, the chestnut flour, I use a lot on fish. So I did the flour on the fish and then, and then egg and then did the, the crumbs right. and then pan fried it. And oh my God, it was so good. But I use, um, I use that chestnut flour to pan fry fish a lot, um, and it's get you, it like deepens that sweetness of the mm -hmm. flour and it just, boy, it's amazing. Um, or I'll like pan sear chicken fry, chicken thighs, and I'll use the, um, the chestnut flour on that too. And it's amazing. And, and again, it's gluten-free, right? So you're, um, you know, if you want to fry something and, you know, just a little bit of coconut oil and, uh, and you, you know, you've got a really healthy meal. Yeah. I like walnuts. Yes. I don't like perch. There, Kenny. Oh my God, I love perch. How do you not like perch? I don't. I think it's because it's always served with the back skin on it or something. It grosses me out. <laughs> okay, you're probably. I'm gonna say ocean perch versus lake perch. Oh, those okay. are two. Ocean perch is disgusting, and it always has that skin on it. Yeah. And lake perch is like light and flaky and sweet and. Okay, just, very, maybe tasty. I very good. Yeah. Perch. <laughs> yeah. And if you go into a restaurant, you better ask if it says perch on the menu, you better ask, is that lake or ocean? Um, because a lot of times it's ocean perch. And oftentimes they will tell you it's lake perch because they don't know. And you'll get ocean perch. It looks different. It tastes different. It's disgusting. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't like junk like fish. I don't like fish with the back skins on them. Yeah. It grosses me out. Yeah. <laughs> 
Although like salmon skin super healthy for you too. So a lot of good omegas in that. Yeah, I I probably wouldn't eat that either. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no thanks. I'm like, Damn it, I'm just not gonna eat that stuff. I know. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah walleye perch is the best yeah yeah lake perch and walleye that's it um yeah so i so the versatility of 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 what you guys have been able to do i think is really really special because it just i think it just kicks the butt of all the other nuts out there you've got the nutritional value and then it's gluten-free which of course so many people um, have gluten intolerances these days. And it's hard to find something that is, that matches, uh, flour, like regular, you know, wheat flour. So, um, so I, and I, I, I think it does that you can, you can like, I, I made that bread when I took it to the nut growers, um, meeting a couple months ago and, um, that was outstanding. So it, it was more like a, um, it was like a banana bread. So, and it, and it baked, it, I did not know the difference that it wasn't um, regular flour. So it baked up really nicely. So you don't yeah, have to worry about natural allergy. sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they well, say that's one of the, one of the secrets of some of the French pastries is using that chestnut flour to give that little subtle sweetness to it. Oh, there. really? Nice. What about in Italy? Do they have all of the different, Oh, you said that's, you said that at the beginning, right? They have all the different types of, they have the flour and the chips and the. There's a tremendous amount of different products that they make over there. Uh, yeah, everything from from beer and liqueurs to pasta and breads and different desserts and cakes. Uh, it, they use the chestnut in many different things because, well, it's part of their culture and they've had it for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, that the tree is is native over there the the romans uh certainly loved the chestnut and uh, took that wherever they conquered the, the lands and so when you drive through the countryside whether it's, it's italy or, or spain or portugal uh, you know you drive here and, and you see a lot of oak and maple trees there you see a lot of chestnuts because it's native and so they're just the mountains will be just covered uh, with chestnut trees. We were over there this summer uh, in, in Spain at a meeting and it happened to be there at the time that the chestnuts were in bloom. And so you could drive through the mountains and you could look across the valleys and a number of miles away and you'd see just big areas that were white because the, the chestnut uh, blooms uh, uh, generally the end of June into July. Uh, and they're just everywhere. Who's making beer so with chestnuts to. now? Isn't that, that, oh. is that local or are you guys sending that south? No, we have a, a brewer down in, oh, I believe it's Columbia. My son has done more of that than, than I have. And uh, the, uh, the, the brewery down in Ann Arbor, the, Mine's a terrible thing to waste. I can't think of the name of that brewery right <laughs> Jolly, now. Not Jolly Pumpkin. Yes. Is Jolly, Jolly Pumpkin. Pumpkin? Okay. Yes. Uh, they'll make a, a chestnut beer. They make a sour chestnut beer also, but they'll make several different chestnut beers. And we've got some uh, local uh, smaller breweries around that uh, will make a chestnut beer. And, and certainly it's very common over there in Europe to find that. Uh, I mean, that's not even I'm so sure much especially beer you can find that in, in in a lot of different stores sounds like it'd be good to wash down some walnut shrimp <laughs> there you go yes <laughs> and the chestnut liqueurs are very good over there also oh god that sounds amazing too sounds amazing i'm getting thirsty i'm, I'm excited because literally just down the street somebody's opening up a meadery so they're gonna be making mead a meter? Oh, mead. Yeah, I was like, a meter. Oh, oh. Sorry, and I have no. a cold too, so that's like, okay. that sounds weird. But no, mead. I was like, we call those butcher shops here, Not but okay. <laughs> yeah. But right. yeah. Oh, I can't wait. 
I'm so excited. They haven't quite opened yet, but it's in an old church, which makes it super cool. I can't wait. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll have to visit when we come down. Yeah. It's, I can't wait. Plus I really like mead. So it'd be great. I don't know that yeah. I've had mead. It's, it's kind of like wine, but it's way stronger and they don't use all of the components. Honey to make wine. There, there, yeah. It's usually made of fermented honey and stuff mm. like that. Okay. I could do that. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come down. We'll go have mead and I'll bring you some chestnuts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I don't know. You won't have any in the shell though. Will you? Bill? We yeah, we'll have them for a while. Oh, okay. Oh, you still so, have yeah, some. So they haven't all been processed right now. We always try to keep some certainly through the through the holidays, so you can have some chestnuts okay. roasting. So yeah, we've got I haven't got a lot. Probably got a couple hundred pounds left. All right, you guys, it's getting close yeah. to nine o'clock. I'm gonna end the chat. I'm gonna end the stream. Plus, my cold is killing me. I just saw you sneezing your butt off there. Oh, it's horrible. As so all of a sudden it comes on and my eyes start watering. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to drop uh, Bill's website here real quick before you um, uh, end that. And so, yeah, if anybody's interested, and Bill has all kinds of um, fruit trees as well. So um, fruit and nut trees. Nice. So you can go on and... Um, check out his website and then reach out to them to get, um, uh, to get your, your products. If you're looking at, um, growing for next year and, um, obviously he's a wealth of knowledge. So if you have any questions, just reach, reach out directly. You can call that rotary phone in the office there. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call that phone right there. That's right. And I did drop, um, so I, I put the links for Michigan fruit and nut growers and Ohio fruit, Ohio nut growers. And those are also, that's how I, that's how I met Bill. And that's how I got interested in um, growing, you know, perennial crops, fruit, nut trees um, was by going to these, these meetings four times a year in these groups. And they, they we have um, private Facebook pages that are just also another great way to get, um, to get your questions answered. So. Yep. And yeah. if you call and if I don't return that call immediately, it's because I'm waiting for that rotary phone. To <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or he's not alive. <laughs> Just don't have a lot of zeros in your, um, in your phone number. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I appreciate you having me on Corky. It's been so fun. It's always great when we can sit and well, chat. I love having you as my co-host. It's great. Awesome. Good. And thank you, Corky. Oh, thank so you, Corky, well. for having me. Oh, well, thank you for coming up. Thank you for teaching us about walnuts. Like, I had no idea. Chestnuts, not walnuts. Ooh, chestnuts. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I have a cold, so I'm like all over the place. But um, no, I there's some things I had no idea about. And the, um, the pollination and stuff like that. Like, this could be a tree that we definitely need to mass produce. Like, make sure that everybody has some. Because you know, there's some, there's some nut trees out there that are risking endangered territories because of the pollination and stuff like that. So I think this is really, really super fascinating. So, well, and how them. easy they are to, um, to crack open too. Right. So it's not yeah. like black walnut or regular walnut, you know, not any of the hard shells. I mean, these are like easy peasy for people, right? Cause we get lazy. You just cut them with a knife. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's really, that's awesome. And so thank you so much for coming up and sharing your knowledge with us. It's, it's really appreciated. And um, thank you once again, Dr. Paula. I really thank appreciate you so much. We love you as always. I, I'm so honored. I'm so happy to be here. So ha happy to be here anytime with you guys. Well, thank you guys yeah. for bearing with me and my cold and everything else. And Joe will be back on Tuesday or Thursday. Well, Thursday with me. I'm traveling back in time. Need to go get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will be on talking about cauliflower. We'll have a giveaway and we'll be talking about the benefits of cauliflower and stuff like that, which I'm really excited. Maybe I will even get some cauliflower seeds. So maybe I will plant some this year. I usually am horrible at brassicas, but I will give it a whirl. 
And I love each and every one of you. And we will see you Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. And y'all have a good night. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Thanks. Good night. Good night. I almost left the studio and said I had ending the stream. <laughs> oh, <good night. laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs>